Good evening. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for being here in person. Thanks to those joining us virtually on Zoom. Um, it's, uh, uh, if, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mac Barrett. I'm the curator of public programming here at Roosevelt House. Uh, on behalf of Roosevelt House Director Harold Holzer and Hunter College President Rab, Jennifer Rabb, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a discussion of plea bargaining, a critical yet often overlooked aspect of criminal justice system. To that end, we are fortunate to have with us two criminal justice experts, both of whom have examined closely the consequences, including the stigma and loss of opportunity faced by justice impacted individuals and the formerly incarcerated. I'll introduce them to you now. Dan Cannon is a civil rights lawyer and a law professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. In his practice, he has served as counsel for plaintiffs in the US Supreme Court case Obergfell versus Hodges which brought marriage equality to all 50 states and in a number of other high profile civil and constitutional rights cases involving wrongful convictions, inmates rights, abuse and overreach by law enforcement and academic freedom. His writing has appeared in the National Law Journal, Above the Law, Salon and Slate. To speak with Mr. Cannon, I'm pleased to also welcome Hunter College Professor of Sociology, Dr. Calvin John Smiley. Dr. Calvin John Smiley is a faculty member at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Program whose research focuses on the sociology of law, race and ethnic relations and criminal justice policy. His scholarship has appeared in the Prison Journal, Race, Ethnicity and Education and Punishment and Society. With Dr. Keisha M. Middlemass, he is co-editor of Prisoner Reentry in the 21st Century, Critical Perspectives of Returning Home. The book at the center of tonight's discussion is called Pleading Out, How Plea Bargaining Creates a Permanent Crim Criminal Class, an incisive, historically informed critique of the practice of plea bargaining. In it, Dan calls plea bargaining a tool for satisfying the insatiable appetite of the prison industrial complex. Publishers Weekly has called Pleading Out a well-reasoned polemic full of persuasive evidence of how the courts are used by those in power to enforce the status quo. This is a cogent call for change. Um, after the program, we will retire to the Four Freedoms Room upstairs for some wine and the sale of books and the signing of books. Um, so please join us for that as well. And also please remember to silence your devices. With that, please welcome Dan Cannon and Calvin John Smiley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for having me. And thank you, uh, Dan, for being here with your uh, new and amazing book, as I was telling you upstairs. So uh, to get us started, uh, Dan Cannon's book invites readers to think about one of the most fundamental processes of the legal system, that being accused uh, of a crime. Despite the array of legal television dramas, films, and literary classics such as To Kill a Mockingbird that highlight jury trials that show an accused standing before their peers in a jury box and legal minds, quote unquote, duking it out as defense attorneys and prosecutors trade evidence, testimony, and other legal jargon, all which is presided over by a judge, Cannon's book blows up this myth. Utilizing non-legal jargon, Professor Cannon highlights how the use of the quote unquote plea bargain has utterly rotten and corrupted the American legal system. In fact, nearly all criminal accusations, roughly 97% in the United States, end in a plea bargain, which leaves the accused found guilty, but typically with a lesser punishment. In fact, Cannon's work highlights how courts and the various actors representing the state will seek out more harsh and punitive punishments for the select few who attempt to take their chances with a jury trial. The book is broken down into four sections. Part one describes much of the history of the criminal court system coming out of the English common law and specifically the rise of plea bargains going from an anom anomaly to a fixture in our courts. Part two invites readers to understand the various actors of the criminal justice system, including police, lawyers, and judges. Part three highlights the various race, class, gender, and other pertinent status, uh, statuses that influence the courts, as well as some of the out most outlandish penalties, such as forcing individuals to attend church or chemical castration. Finally, part four undertakes the task of thinking about how to undo many of the problems with the legal system and the attempts being made to input justice into the justice system. So with that, I'm happy and honored to be able to have this discussion with Professor Cannon tonight, and I'll start this conversation with some questions. 
So the first question, and I guess the most obvious question, is could you just elaborate on what a plea bargain is, especially uh, uh, versus just pleading guilty? Sure, and, and thank you so much for all your generous words, and thanks to you, Mac, too. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming and for having me. Um, so a plea bargain is, uh, in the American sense, and I'll clarify what I mean by the American sense later, because we do this differently in the United States than any place else in the world. But a plea bargain, there's two different kinds of plea bargain. And there's what we call charge bargaining, where a prosecutor changes the charges, something that, uh, that, that an arrestee is charged with, um, based on a bargaining process. And then there's sentence bargaining, which means they change the range of time that a person is sentenced to prison or uh, to, has to go to jail or has to be on probation or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and, and in modern American plea bargaining, we have decided that we are um, essentially going to give prosecutors free reign over this process. In other words, they can use any kind of carrot and any kind of stick that they want to get someone to plead guilty because the emphasis is on expediency, the emphasis is on getting as many convictions as quickly as possible and ramming people through the system as quickly as you can do it. Um, what's so insidious about our American version of plea bargaining is not only that we give prosecutors so much power in the process, um, but also that there is basically no oversight of it. Um, this happens in secret. The lawyers get together. They talk about what the deal is going to be, and they bring that, usually in a conference room, sometimes the defendant is involved, usually not, and they bring that deal to the judge, and the judge says, okay, is this what you agreed to? And the defendant lies and says, yeah, sure. And you understand everything? Yes, uh, yeah, I definitely understood everything. And that's it. No jury ever looks at it. No fact finder ever looks at the case. There's no scrutiny of uh, any sort of evidence or any sort of uh, uh, factual material. Um, and a higher court never sees the case. Um, and so that's, that's where we are with plea bargaining in America. And you know, what's really interesting is, you know, as you mentioned in the book, about 97% of people actually take a plea bargain. So that's basically everyone. And even um, as I was telling you upstairs, you know, guys who I work with at Rikers don't even know that, right? And then they're all kind of waiting for their plea bargain to come up. But, you know... Uh, well, they know it because it's part right. of, like, that's part of the culture for justice-involved right. people. And, and, and part of what makes this such an intractable problem in this country is because this is the way everybody does it. And so once you've been involved, either you're totally outside of the criminal justice system and you probably don't think about it that much and you don't go to court and you don't, you know, like even legal academics we were talking about upstairs, you know, don't spend much time in the courthouse and don't really understand that it's just a bureaucratic nightmare. You know, there's nothing like justice being dispensed there. Um, and, and part of the culture is, and this is for attorneys and for defendants too, you know, people that have been in the justice system know you're going to go in and you're going to take some kind of plea. You know, it's not even in your head that this could possibly go to trial or there could be some deeper mission to find the truth here. Um, and and it's, true for, it's true for defense attorneys and for prosecutors too. We all know going into it that this is very likely not going to trial. This is very likely gonna end in whatever the best deal is we can all come up with. And so you, say, you state right in the beginning of the book, the American jury trial is dead. And so, you know, as I said in my intro, right, we see all these crime shows that, you know, I'm thinking Law and Order and all of the rest, that really depict the, the jury trial. Um, if they don't exist, why is there such an emphasis in our media and other, um, you know, films and things like that to depict it? I mean, it's, you know, it's a centuries-old mythology. You know, it's as old at least as the Oresteia. I don't know, probably older than that. You know, <laughs> where, where you have this idea that there's going to be, you know, the public, the community is going to sit in judgment of, of somebody who's accused of a crime. And the community makes a decision, the community evaluates the evidence and looks at it and says, hmm, you know, and this, there's this whole dramatic show that happens. And in reality, what we have is a justice system that is just a bureaucratic process, like I said, you know, cramming as many people through. And there is no search for the truth. There is no, you know, focus on um, what the evidence is and what the facts are and whether there's enough evidence to even charge the case in the first place. 
because a cop brings a, a, a case to a prosecutor and the prosecutor says, all right, I'm gonna get a conviction on this somehow. You know, either I'll give them a carrot or I'll give them a stick, we're gonna get this conviction. And you don't know that if you're not involved in the justice system. Again, most of us are not, right? If you're a lawyer that's working on the inside of the justice system, or you study the justice system and you watch it very closely, um, like Dr. Smiley does, then you know what it's about. But for lawyers, we, you know, we're the, the quintessential criminal justice insiders, and this is the way we've been doing things for at least two generations now. We know that we're gonna just ram and jam these cases through. We're gonna get the, the, the cases off our desks as quickly as possible, and the plea bargain is the only way that we can do it. That process, over the last 200 years, has excluded everybody else. So there's a very small fraction of people that actually sit on juries um, every year. So you know what, 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 we're, what we're left with is most of the public knowing nothing about criminal justice and how it works, and so you're left with this sort of mythologized you know, TV version of trials and justice and everything else. And then there's the criminal just, justice insiders, like me, where we just are like, okay, this is the way it, this is the way it is. You know, we're gonna we're gonna get this done as quickly as possible and move on to the next thing because there's no time to do it any other way. Yeah, and it seems like it's it's to help us feel good. It, it's the illusion of justice that I think a lot of people are searching for, not actually the 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 <laughs> the actual justice. And then we do see, you know, with um, I'm thinking as you were speaking, you know, the the uh, the jury trial of Derek Chauvin right, with the George Floyd murder. And so we see that on TV, we watch that, and so people think, okay, that's how it goes, but you know, how many other people who have been accused, what have you, uh, that is not the case uh, at all. I'm glad you said that. I mean, the, the, the illusion of the thing is very important. And defense attorneys get mad at me over this, you know, public defenders get mad at me over this, but it's really true. You know, as we've seen more and more rights supposed rights on paper extended to people accused of a crime over the 20th century. Yeah. So all those things are wonderful. Miranda rights, great. Sixth Amendment right to counsel, public defenders, you know, Gideon, all that stuff that we talk about in law school. Great, that's all wonderful you know, stuff. Uh, evidentiary protections that are extended to uh, criminal defendants and you know, uh, uh, all, the, all the nice things that we've said the Constitution offers them, great. That, that built up throughout the 20th century, and what it looks like is a system that favors criminal defendants, and what we have is anything but that. You know, so, well, you had all these evidentiary protections. You had a lawyer that was guaranteed to you. You have all these, all these things that are, that are in place, that the system puts in place to protect you, and yet, with the number of people in our prisons continues to stack up year after year after year after year, even after, you know, like you put in more protections in place and lo and behold, the prisons get fatter and fatter. And so in part one, you talk about a lot of the history of plea bargaining and I really found that very interesting because we always hear about it, but even myself didn't really know the kind of the roots and where, where it comes from. And one of the things that I found so fascinating is how you discuss how um, plea bargaining was, was not intended to be the rule. Right, it was intended to be kind of the exception, and in in kind of early uh, uh, you know colonial America, in some cases they wouldn't even let you plea. Oh, it was yeah, it was completely unheard of, completely unheard of. Um, well, I'll let you finish. Well, your yeah, question, so so I guess <laughs> I, you know you you were kind of talking about this over the 20th century, and as you know more things like Gideon and 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 and, and Miranda rights, but there was also, and you do touch upon this in the book, you know it. The, the shift in our kind of legal culture kind of comes at a particular nexus of um, labor rights, emancipation of, of, uh, of enslaved Africans, and um, the gain of women's rights, right? And we think about all of these kind of populations that systematically were not only stripped, but it was, um, that was the rule. And so can you just talk a bit about, you know, so is the system racist? <laughs> well, is it sexist? Yes. Is it classist? Uh, yes, yes to all of those things. But I mean, you know, if you if you look at, at at the class history, what I've tried to do is, I mean, there are a lot. There's a lot of great books about you know um, how how the law is racist and, and perpetuates um, racism. Um, what I've tried to do in this book is to to dig back further and to look at the mechanisms that um, the law uses and has used. 
for hundreds of years to sort people into different groups. And sometimes that's based on race, and sometimes it's based on you know uh, whether you own land or not, or that sort of thing. Um, so in the 1830s, and, and to go back to what you said, I mean, it was taboo. Plea bargaining was taboo. It was illegal. In the early 1840s, even, um, in Massachusetts, where plea bargaining got its start, you see prosecutors being prosecuted for trying to cut deals to criminal defendants. Like, it was completely unheard of. And as you say, there's, 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 uh, you know, there's um, cases from the time, that time period, that where courts didn't want to take guilty pleas, even if somebody just said, I don't care what you do to me. I'm guilty, I did it, I committed this horrible murder, and I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court. Like, no, 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 we're not going to take your guilty. You're going to go to have, you're going to have a trial. That was the attitude, you know, in, in the early 19th century. So in the 1830s, things start changing. And if you look at the socioeconomic um, stuff that was going on in New England in the 1830s, you know, in Boston, where we think plea bargaining originated, you've got an explosion in population just in the 1830s of 50 percent, right? So this po the population shoots up with European Im immigrants and migrant workers from all over the country coming to work uh, in, in the mills, essentially, in New England, and, and where the Industrial Revolution was really booming. And these folks start to uh, become class conscious, right? Because they're living on top of each other, and they're working with each other, and they're, you know, uh, they're, they're talking to each other every day. And so a degree of class consciousness develops, and the labor movement really starts to take off in the United States. The first federation of uh, labor unions was formed in New York in 1834. Well, you also you see a shift at that time um, where courts start to take more and more and more and more guilty pleas. Right? And we don't necessarily know that that was the result of plea bargaining at that time until later on. Uh, but you can, you can divine that. Basically, you can surmise that based on the evidence because you have basically no guilty pleas prior to 1830s, and you see that number ramp up slowly over uh, the rest of the 19th century. So, what's going on there that's really important to understand is that um, white male suffrage uh, is essentially universal by 1830. And that means you've got working class white men, unlanded white men, sitting on juries. And to understand why that's such a threat to the status quo, um, other than the obvious, uh, you know, you also have to understand that juries were extremely powerful at that period in time. So they could trust landed white men with the kind of awesome power that juries had. Juries are still very powerful. But back then, the juries decided, we think of the jury now as being a finder of fact. You know, the jury sit and decide what the facts are, the judge provides you with the law. Well, back then, juries also decided the law, right, in New England. They decided not only uh, did the guy run the red light, did the defendant run the red light, but also should it be illegal for someone to run a red light? Right? That's a terrible example for the 19th century, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, more with like a horse. So that would yeah, probably yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Did they have red lights for horses? I don't. I'm not a historian, but here it is. Um, so, so that's going on. You have uh, some diversity, right, being injected into, into juries. And the courts are really actively involved at that time in breaking the back of organized labor, right? They're hard at work prosecuting groups of workers for uh, under conspiracy statutes, right? So if they, a group of workers gets, gets together and says, we'd like to have higher pay, they get prosecuted in Boston for conspiring, right? And in 1842, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts says, no, you can't do that anymore. That's not really conspiracy. And from that point on, you see a whole lot more prosecuting, and, and, and part of the reason for that, by the way, is because you've got working class white men sitting on juries, and they're very sympathetic to these workers that are getting prosecuted. And a lot of these prosecutions are falling flat, and prosecution witnesses are getting beat up outside the courthouse and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> you've got um, juries changing. The court says you can't prosecute uh, organized labor for being organized labor anymore. And by the 1850s, 
the, uh, the courts have taken away the power to decide the law from juries uh, in New England. And this is a big part of the Constitutional Convention in Massachusetts. In 1853, I think it is, uh, there's this big discussion about you know, whether they're going to take away power, the power uh, to decide the law from juries legislatively, which they do. Uh, ultimately, they say the juries, you can't decide the law anymore. It's a big debate. So people say, I mean, we take it for granted now. The juries don't decide the law. You know, in my whole career, I was like, juries don't do the law. The judges do the law. Um, but it was a big debate in Massachusetts in 1853. So the jury's power is taken away. Uh, labor unions are on the rise. They stop prosecuting people for just organizing. Um, and you've got. Um, <clears throat> Looking at the numbers on cases that end in guilty pleas, it's essentially zero in 1830. By 1850, that number is 50% in Massachusetts, right? 50% of all criminal cases, it's incredible. And what's happening is, instead of prosecuting these workers for doing organized labor stuff, they're prosecuting them for other things. They're prosecuting the individual workers to bring them into the system and bring them to heel under vagrancy statutes or drunken disorderly or whatever they can find. So they're getting them one by one by one by one by one. Now you can't do that, you can't make all those criminals um, with sympathetic juries, number one, and really it's hard to do it with juries at all. And so you see the rise of plea bargaining. So you've taken power away from the juries, you get, the juries can no longer decide the law, and we're going to make it so most criminal cases don't even get to a jury. That continues in New England, and again, no plea bargaining in 1830, 50% by 1850, that number is 88% by 1880, right? And the significance of that is that, I mean, this eventually takes over all over the country by the early 20th century. The significance of that is that we have basically never tried a citizen jury system, ever in this country. Um, do you want to take a guess as to when women could vote, or I'm sorry, could uh, not vote, could, uh, could sit on juries in Massachusetts? So, uh, uh, 20th century. 20th, it's the 20th century. century, but when in the 20th century? 1940? Close. 50s? 1950. 1950. 1950. So women couldn't even sit on a jury in Massachusetts until 1950, right? And... By then, the jury trial essentially had gone extinct mm. in New England, and it starts to happen every place else after Prohibition. But that's a very long answer to yeah, the question. Yeah, no, no, and, 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 and I, I'm glad you brought up right there at the end Prohibition, because in your book you talk about kind of Prohibition really being kind of a, kind of a, a turning point in bloating the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. and really um, after Prohibition is over, Right? You have all these people with jobs who now want to keep their jobs. So how do you keep your jobs? Well, you continue to criminalize. And we see the you know, uh, uh, marijuana and other kind of laws that come out of it. And uh, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but I do have a question like bringing it up a little bit closer to, to our time, yeah, too. Yeah. So you know, coming out of the civil rights movement, we see, and you talk about um, the tough on crime era. And we still see it today right? with um, politicians who want to get elected, who all have this kind of tough on crime mantra, whether they're uh, outwardly saying it or they're enacting policies that do it. But you state in your book, and I think it's quite accurate, it's not really a, uh, a position of tough on crime, but tough on poor people. And so can you just elaborate on how these policies um, that then criminalize people uh, are disproportionately exacted on certain uh, demographics of our society. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, it, yeah, it's sort of become this, this chimera, this you know, Frankenstein's monster that we started in the, in the early 20th century. And um, you know, it's, it started with prohibition, as you say. And the federal government builds this big apparatus to enforce crime, because there's just so many new criminals that have been created overnight in 1919. Um, and you know, in Herbert Hoover's inaugural address, this is right in the middle of Prohibition, and the whole thing is focused on expedience. It is, we've got to, there are so many criminals out there, folks. There are just so many, and we've got to get them. It's not just the bootleggers. 
but it's the people who assist the bootleggers and the people who assist the people who assist the bootleggers. And so the federal government gets a hold of this thing and decides that, well, expedience is going to be the number one thing that drives criminal justice, and the states, the states gradually catch on to that, too. Um, and they set about to criminalizing everything, right? Everything, everywhere. Um, and, you know, fast forward to now, and the, the average American professional, I think there's a statistic in the book, the average American professional can sit at their computer and commit three felonies a day and not even know it, right? You go out on the street, you're going to break 25 laws, whether you realize it or not, right? Intent doesn't matter. Um, that's the monster that we've built out of the criminal law throughout the 20th century. It just sort of snowballed from prohibition. Well, let's criminalize this, let's criminalize that. Um, and it's all, about, it's all about bringing people to heel. I mean, what I talk about in the book is it's about you know, uh, uh, separating people in the lower classes and having them fight because of the psychological effect um, of, that, the, of slapping the criminal label on somebody. But what's happened with policing and with prosecution, to answer your question, is that, okay, so now you can criminalize anything and everything. Um, and police have the discretion to go out and arrest somebody for doing something or anything or nothing at all. And they know they can do that because when they bring that case back to the prosecutor, the prosecutor is substantially likely um, to get a conviction somehow, right? Because of all the powers that we've given the prosecutor. That's a whole other thing. Um, that's another thing that we decided to do throughout the 20th century is cut every break to, to, to the prosecutors, let them do whatever they want. Um, and, and so since police know that it, there's, there's two big results of this, right? Having all that discretion in policing means um, that, that they know that they're never going to be put under a microscope. They know that they're never really going to have to present any real evidence or testify. You know, in 97% of their cases, they're never going to have to, or more, you know, they're never going to have to really um, account for anything. They're never going to be held accountable, even if they... Um, have totally lied about the circumstances. Now, we've got stories in the book about police officers that just make stuff up or charge people with crimes that don't even exist, knowing that once they get into the system, either the prosecutor will get a conviction on something, doesn't matter what it is, um, or if the case gets bounced out. I mean, since speed is the number one principle, is the guiding principle, you know, like there's not going to be any accountability here. They're just going to move on to the next thing. Nobody's going to generally don't stop and look at a cop and say, well, you did this, you did a wrong thing here, because you just got to get on to the next one. Right, or as you even point out, in some cases, and maybe even more than some, but part of that plea bargain is to waive your right to appeal. So even if something comes out, they can't actually do anything about it. That's right. Um, and so, you know, as I was reading your book, I was thinking about right here in New York City, our new mayor, uh, Eric Adams, and, you know, at, you know, he didn't want any unhoused people on the trains. So there was this whole push to push people off of our trains. And then in March, we saw these, you know, uh, bulldozers essentially taking out these, these, these uh, tented communities and things like that. And, you know, he's, he's saying this as, you know, I'm trying to clean up our streets and I'm, I'm making us safer. Well, crime has still continued to rise. And it was really just a kind of war on, on poor people again, right? I mean, we see this constantly happening where um, the criminal justice system, or the criminal legal system, we should say, just exact, exacts itself on uh, people who have the least amount in our society. Because they're easy, they're easy prey. They're easy prey. You know you're not going to get that much pushback from, from the poor. And so, you know, let's just say that uh, giving all that discretion to officers essentially is like, is like no law at all, right? So you give the discretion to officers to go out and arrest somebody for anything, anytime, you know, whatever you can come up with. They can always come up with something, right? And they know that it's going to stick most of the time. So you, you send a racist cop out. That only he knows what's in his head, right? Send a racist cop out. And they arrest no white people at all, just black people, and that's the only person, that's the only kind of people that they arrest for the entirety of their career. Who's ever going to call them on it? You know, because those people get convicted every single time. They're going to come back and plead to something. Right, yeah. or even the cops who aren't 
outright card-carrying members of the neo-Nazi party, exactly. but just because they're put into environments where their entire training, they're told it's us versus them, you're going to a war zone, everyone's a, a perp, everyone's a thug. So, you know, you put someone into a position where now they're in an environment where they see everyone as a criminal, yeah. regardless of their own personal identifying as maybe a, a, an outwardly racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and everybody is a criminal, right? Like, you know, everybody's out there doing crime 100% of the time because everything is criminalized. So the question is, how do we get the most number of convictions, the fastest that we possibly can? Do we go to rich neighborhoods and arrest people who can hire private defense counsel and you know, potentially have to make me testify about the you know, Like, no, of course not. They're gonna go to poor neighborhoods and clean houses, just arrest after arrest after arrest after arrest, knowing that all that is gonna end up, like almost all those arrests are gonna end up in convictions. And, and an officer could do this without having a racist thought in their head. And because of historic segregation and redlining practices, they, it just happens that it just so happens that I arrested nothing but black people for six months. And that, you know, that's, but that doesn't make me I'm a racist. I'm doing my I'm job. Just, yeah, I'm doing my job. Look at, look, I, I should get a pat on the back. All those people, all those arrests ended in convictions. So that's a post hoc justification. Like, I did my job. I did a good job. I got all those arrests. And that's the way we've set up, you know, the, the, the sort of um, incentive system for police officers in most departments in the country. Now, I talked to a guy uh, that's a former uh, United States attorney, which is one of the, the few uh, federal prosecutors that um, will really be honest about what was motivating his office and what was, you know, um, going on. And uh, he's, he talks about how they would get their resources in that office were dependent on the number of convictions that they got, right? So, you know, you drive up a whole bunch of convictions, you maximize your number of convictions, and all of a sudden you got more attorneys and you got more staff and you got more paralegals and more things that you can work with and a bigger budget. So, you know, it's a perverse set of incentives. Yeah, and that kind of leads me to my next question or, or next kind of topic here is that, you know, the, the main title is pleading out, which kind of shows us how these plea bargains work, but I think, um, just as important is kind of the subtitle of the book, which is how plea bargains create a permanent criminal class. So, you know, what, what does that mean? What do you mean by a criminal class? How does that operate? How does that then impact people even post-conviction yeah. um, when, they, when they do eventually get out? All right, I think we're in a good place to talk about this without having to backtrack and pick up a whole bunch of other stuff. I think we covered everything that we need to cover for this. There's so many moving pieces. All right, um, so there's always been a, a criminal class right, since probably the dawn of human civilization. I don't know. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's written about in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome where it's like, all right, somebody is a criminal and they're put into this box and those are the criminals and you avoid them, you don't hang out with them, you don't let, their kids, you don't let your kids marry them, you don't, you know, you don't consort with those of the criminal class. That, that ancient stigma has remained intact uh, clear up until today. Um, and what's so interesting about that is that now we've got a criminal justice system, we've got a system of criminal laws that doesn't really correspond to cultural norms or the mores of a society. And in fact, it's a criminal justice system that has completely removed the public um, altogether to the point where we have legislators uh, that I interviewed for the book, that don't even know what criminal laws they're signing. They, they have a criminal bill comes up, and they're like, yeah, this sounds pretty good. Uh, trespassing to critical infrastructure, a million dollar fine. Great, check the box, that sounds good. You're like, nobody's gonna call me on it if I vote, uh, if I vote for this, this criminal law. I don't really know what it says or does, but that's, and, and that's what legislators are doing everywhere. And I was lucky enough to ha talk to a few that were very candid about the process. Like, well, we don't read that. You know. uh, so <clears throat> criminal, criminal laws are, you know, good. even the uh, you know, true blue Democrats are going to sit there and vote for them because they're, they're afraid that they're going to be used, you know, it's going to be used against them in the next election cycle. And it's a pretty safe bet that you can just, and so you've got all these criminal laws that continue to, to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, and so, as a result, um, what we've got is a situation where almost everybody, and I don't want to say almost everybody, but one, almost one in every three adults has a criminal or arrest record 
in the United States. It's an enormous number. Um, and the psychological effects, um, and I, I know you've done a lot of work on this, you know, the, the psychological effect of labeling someone a criminal is profound. It's still as profound, almost as profound today as it was in ancient Rome or in ancient Greece. There's still a stigma attached to anybody that's been labeled a criminal. And, um, and that stigma persists in, you know, in, our, in our communities. You still don't want your kids to hang out with criminals. And oh my God, we don't stand in solidarity with criminals. And we don't you know, open businesses with criminals, right? Um, it's just an easy, ready-made underclass that all of these people have been swept into. And not only um, does the community at large believe that we shouldn't play with criminals, but the, the people that we've labeled criminals themselves don't want to play. Uh, you look at the psychology of the thing, and, and folks are um, you know, adopt more antisocial behaviors, more of what we would call criminal behaviors. They withdraw from society as just as a result of having that label slapped on them, right? Whether they've done something truly heinous or not. Um, and that has uh, had a profound effect on um, solidarity among the lower classes, which if you go back to the original purposes for um, a system of plea bargaining in the first place, which was to bust up solidarity among the lower classes, bust up worker solidarity, right? To pit people against each other. Um, that's what was going on in the 1830s when it became apparent that they didn't have the police power to um, prosecute all these workers for just organizing, then they start to get them one by one by one. And that not only put them in a place where they could be kept under control by the state to a degree, but it also alienated them from their communities. You know, it's like, oh, that guy's a criminal. You know, he does criminal things. Um, and that's what's happened now, only we have amplified and extended the boundaries of our criminal class far beyond uh, anything that the world has ever seen in the United States. Like one out of every three people is a lot. Yeah, and, and, and beyond just the psychological effects, it's the very real social, legal, yes. political yes. effects of losing out on your right to vote, but you know, I, I, you know, losing out on your right to housing. Uh, you know, uh, you can't live in public housing if you if you're on parole or probation. Um, and one thing that I find yeah. with uh, a lot of folks that I've worked with is they they essentially le lose out on their First Amendment right because in a lot of times. If you're on parole or probation, you might have a stipulation that says you can't be associated with other known felons. So uh, what that might mean is, say you want to go to a, a Black Lives uh, Matter rally, or you want to go to uh, the low, you know, not even something political. You want to go something apolitical, and police start to get arresting people. A fight breaks out, and uh, Dan's on parole and I'm on probation, and we both get arrested. Um, his thing will come back with a ding that he's on parole, and my thing comes back with a ding on probation. That cop could say, "Oh, well, you guys were uh, associating together. I'm going to take you down to the to the local precinct," and you know it might end with Dan eight hours later going home, and it was a big mistake. But it could end up with me actually having to go to to serve uh, time. So so we see how it has like these really big collateral consequences. And so the last question I'll ask before we, we open it up to to the audience is. Um, you really paint a picture of a dismal system, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, and that's not to say that you don't put uh, beams of light in there that could, we could break through, but, you know, you really show that we have a system that's filled with both improper actors, actors who are just complicit with the system, or others who just want to look the other way or bury their head, head in the sand and say, well, it's not my problem. And so, as I said, you give various solutions, both um, talking from the top uh, down and also from the bottom up, and I'd love to hear you talk about them a little bit more as you as you call them various reforms to our system. Um, the one thing, though, I do want to push you on a bit is uh, um, why not just call for an abolition of the system? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I mean, if I had control of the whole criminal justice system, I'm not sure I want that kind of power. But yeah, you know, I don't think that. I don't think that if you were to, let's put it this way, if you were to conceptualize a criminal justice system, you know, how would you do it? 
Would it be one where 97% uh, of all cases end up in no fact finding whatsoever and just you know whatever deal you can work out, the best deal that the lawyers can work out? Probably not, right? Probably not something like that. Um, you know, I do want to go back to the last thing that we were talking about and say that, that an important thing to understand about how plea bargaining operates, like the real genius of it, is that you think that you did it, right? You know, that's, that's, that's the real, that's like where, where the psychology of the thing really comes into effect is that, you know, it's not that other people sat in judgment of you and said that you did it. You said you did it. You admitted to it. Um, you know, and, and, and it's, tough to <laughs> it's tough to sort of unravel all of that, right? You know, um, and I, I think when you look at the various um, solutions that are out there, most of them are completely unrealistic. A total abolition of the system is not particularly realistic. It's a nice thing to think about. But from where we sit right now, historically, you know, I don't think that we're going to be able to just tear the whole criminal justice system down and start over. Now, we may be pleasantly surprised, and, and we get to do that. Um, and there's a lot of people that have a lot of great ideas about how to do it. But one of my goals in writing this book was, what can we do now? Like, what can people do about this right now? Um, one of the things is to recognize the problem in the first place, because that defeats some of the underlying psychology. If you know that this is all a scam, basically, right? Like you don't have to be tricked into thinking that you're guilty of something just because you got arrested for something, right? You, you go in and you plead guilty, and you're like, well, I pleaded guilty, so I guess I'm going to take my lumps, and now it's, you know, six months of solitary, or, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, never being able to get a good job for the rest of my life, or whatever, right? Um, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily follow that just because you get convicted of something, or just because you plead guilty to something, um, that the state should have its way with you any, any way and every way that it wants to. So I think that's one important thing, is you know, as lawyers, we need to educate our clients a little bit better, and it's difficult to do because there's so much work out there. Uh, but we need to educate our clients a little bit better about you know, what their rights are, the fact that you don't have to plead just because everybody else in your community is doing it, or everybody else in your cell block is doing it, or whatever. Um, and to sort of try to defeat the cultural default of the plea bargain. That's a really tough thing to do. Um, and I don't think that, I mean, I think lawyers have a role in it. I don't think that it can be lawyer driven, uh, certainly not defense attorney driven, because you have to still act in the best interest of your client. And if your client ultimately at the end of the day says, I want to take that deal, I mean, you should have your eye on system wide problems, but you have to do what you have to do for that client. Prosecutors, um, elected prosecutors, I think, can go a long way towards changing the system, towards reforming things, towards um, you know, uh, not, uh, not sort of wielding all the tools that they've been given by courts over the years to do whatever when it comes to plea bargaining. And um, you know, there's, some, there's some stories in there about I mean, the, 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 the common lore that we hear and that I've heard for my entire career is that if we reduce the number of cases that end in a plea bargain, you know, if we substantially reduce that number, then what's gonna happen is the whole system crashes. Right? The system just simply can't bear it. Um, and that appears to be untrue. And I think that we should, you know, at, at least the legal community should start to dispel that rumor. Uh, we do have uh, evidence from Alaska and uh, from New Orleans and from El Paso and from other jurisdictions around the world. Um, but even within the United States, you know, what we see is when uh, plea bargaining is rolled back, um, the system doesn't crash necessarily. What it does is it adapts. This happened in Alaska in the 1970s. Uh, you've got an attorney general that comes in and says, all right, I'm running the show and we're not doing any more plea bargaining. All the plea bargains are going to come through me. You don't get to just do whatever you want, right? And everybody was really mad about that for a little while in the 70s, right? The public defenders were mad, and the cops were mad, and the prosecutors were mad. But what happened was, um, overnight in Alaska, as a result of that policy change by one prosecutor, you have um, prosecutors in Alaska at that point were rejecting about 4% of the cases 
that police were bringing them. And overnight, that number jumped to 40%, right? So they start looking a lot more closely at these cases. Like, we don't have time to try all these cases. So we better screen out the bad ones and just focus on the stuff that really matters to the community. And that's what happened for about a decade in Alaska. And then you get another, you know, prosecutor. The reason why it doesn't really create lasting changes is because you get another prosecutor in there that wants to change the, you know, change the, uh, the plea bargaining back to the old ways, and that's what happens. Um, but it makes police smarter. It makes them more careful in their investigation. Um, and it makes uh, prosecutors more careful about the cases, you know, what they do with their cases. Uh, so, and, and it's just a, a, a small restriction, right? I think if you roll, if you increase the number of trials by 10 or 20 percent, um, you start to see some of the effects of that happen. And that's, that's what we've seen th you know, in, the, in the few places where it's been attempted in America, that's what we've seen. Um, but I think that, that my point in the last um, couple of chapters in the book is that a lasting change is not likely to happen through prosecutors' offices or through elected legislators because the legislators don't care. They're just cramming through whatever criminal legislation shows up on their desk. Um, and the executive branch doesn't care, and politicians in general don't really care about this. I mean, even in an age where we've got, you know, the Koch brothers saying, well, we really need some criminal justice reform, you know, there's still stuff like this. And I, I've got the story in here. Of, of a million dollar trespassing bill. You know, there's, this just passed in Oklahoma, this million dollar trespassing, well, tra trespassing's already illegal um, in, in most of the country, but they needed to push through this million dollar fine, you know, and however much jail time for people who set up a Facebook event that then people come to the Facebook event and they trespass onto critical gas and infrastructure. And so the person that set up that Facebook event can now be fined $1 million. You know, that's the kind of criminal legislation that's going through. And so when you have, you know, you don't have any willingness by legislators, by, you know, the sort of governing institutions in American society to make any of the changes that we need to make. Um, so how do you do it on your own? Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> that's, a lot, that's a lot to think about. But uh, at this point, uh, can we just give... Uh, Professor Cannon, a round of applause. Thank you. And uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. So I see one, and then I see two, and then three. I think there's a mic coming for you. A mic? Yeah. Real fancy. Um, uh, no question. I can tell by your jacket. You like this? I do. <laughs> we'll talk later. OK. I feel um, so underdressed. I mean, he, he, I mean he, at least well, one of us looks good. Kentucky I look like. And he's from New York. Yeah, no, I, I look. I know. I, I know. It's. It's. Uh, I, this. This is very. Uh, this is very hip in Kentucky. I promise you. Uh, it doesn't well, look at all like we'll I talk. walked five miles okay. across the city in the rain earlier. Anyway. So, my first question is: Are there crimes that demand a trial? I mean, you know, like all murders require trials. Armed robbery. I'm making it up, but are there? No. 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 Okay. So let's let's think about murder, right? Somebody is accused of murder. The prosecutor has the ability in most jurisdictions, uh, probably all of them, uh, in the United States, to charge that as capital murder and put the death penalty on the table, or to charge it as you know assault one, or wanton endangerment, or something like that, where you might get a year or two. So s somebody right. will determine what gobbledygook of language, and that's not questioned? Well, uh, no, it's not questioned because we, it's, it's that question has been resolved. <laughs> the question has been resolved. They, they, they can do it. Prosecutors can do it. And prosecute, it's not unusual for a prosecutor in the United States to threaten a defendant with death, literally threaten them with death for going to trial, right? That's, what, that's the way we've decided we want to do things in American society. One of the most chilling statistics in this book that surprised me when I was doing the research, 75% of all the people that are on death row in the United States right now would not be there if they had taken a guilty plea. Because right? a, a jury trial would have surfaced it's, it's the truth. No, it's when they no. insist upon a jury trial in the first place that the prosecutor then puts the death penalty on the table. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you take 
you're going to take life in prison without parole. Or you, you, you take life without for 25 years, something like that. Right? That's the deal you're going to take. But if you make me go through a trial, we're going to charge this as a death penalty case. Mm-hmm. Right? 75% of the people on death row, if they had taken the offer that the prosecution gave them, um, would not be sitting on death row. <laughs> and that is startling to me because you think about who is, who is more likely to plead guilty to a heinous murder, right? I, I, even if you don't like the death penalty, I don't. I mean, you like to think that we reserve it for the worst of the worst of the worst people in society, right? Um, but that's not what those numbers suggest. To me, those numbers suggest that you know, if you are factually innocent of a murder, you are less likely to take a plea to anything, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to roll your dice with the jury mm-hmm. and say, surely the jury will find me innocent because I am innocent, right? Um, and, and so in some ways, I think it makes it more likely that you end up with innocent people sitting on death row. I I was just going to follow up real quick, just like I'll give you like a New York example. So I work with a lot of youth who are incarcerated here in New York. And you might have four, five, six kids who are all charged with some varying degree of manslaughter or murder for one person. And they'll all get arrested and they'll all go spend time in the juvenile system. And they will all plead guilty at some point. But Mathematically, if one person, and I'm not, you know, reducing a, a person's death, but six people couldn't have killed one person with one gun. But six people, six children, will go to prison for that because the cops will arrest everyone, hope that they flip. If they don't flip, they all go. Even if they do flip, they still might get time. Mm-hmm. So you might see cases where, uh, you know, one one crime, but multiple people being charged and found guilty or plead out to maybe a lesser charge. So instead of it being murder, that gives them 25 to life, they'll reduce it down to a manslaughter, which might be eight years. They've already been in the juvenile system two years. They only have to do 85%. They have time served. So they'll go upstate for maybe four years. They'll be out by 21, and that's how they'll, and that's how they'll get them to plead guilty. Um. <coughs> One more question, and I promise. Yeah, and then right over here. Okay. Um, Is there a country that does a better job that we could use as a role model? All of them. (laughs) Okay, well, let's, you know, I've heard a lot of big numbers now, but could you give me some specifics that if... Yeah, yeah, yes. Please. Um, So let's think about arrest rates, okay? Um, It is, uh, out of every 100,000 people, I think the the arrest rate in Canada is 600 people, right? In... Uh, in Great Britain, it's 1,400. In the United States, it's 3,000, right? So um, that suggests either that we, uh, you know, it's, uh, those numbers suggest that either, either we produce criminals at an astonishing rate, like a high rate here in the United States because of something, something that's in the water or, you know, too much sex on TV or violent video games or whatever, or that we have artificial systems in place that are criminalizing people at a higher rate. Um, And and because you've got uh, police on the street that know that all of their arrests are gonna basically end in convictions, they just go and arrest everybody. Um, That doesn't happen any place else really in the world. Uh, The highest highest rates uh, are somewhere around 80%. um, of criminal cases subject to a guilty plea. That's the highest, and I think that's like Scotland. Um, I feel like maybe Poland is very high, I can't remember. But you look at other common law countries, countries that have very close systems to ours, Canada, um, India, uh, England, you know, and, and most of them top out no higher than 75%. In, uh, in India, I think they, they do less than 1% of their cases via plea bargain. And you know, if you look at those other countries, I'm not necessarily saying that we should adopt a criminal justice system that's just like India's, but um, almost everybody does it better than we do, and you can tell by the outcomes. 
you know, and the civil law systems that are in other countries in, in Western Europe and so on, I mean, you, you've got basically the common law system that is um, uh, the countries that I just explained in Australia, um, and then the civil law system, which is a whole, I mean, it's difficult to compare the two systems. So you'd look just at the common law systems. And we lock up more people, we arrest more people, we have more people subject to carceral control, way more people, I mean, than any other society in the history of the world. So everybody is doing it better than we are. Um, but I think it's worth noting that you just swing that by 10 to 15 percent in the United States. You, you aim for having 10 to 15 percent more trials. Um, and that puts us pretty close to like where Scotland is, right? If we go down, a, you know, down 20 percent, if we increase the number of trials by 20 percent, then we get to about where Canada and the UK are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I took a course, I'm a senior and therefore I have the ability to audit courses at the City University. I took a course at John Jay College on uh, criminal justice. And the professor there, it seems, contradicted you completely. What he, first of all, he was a black man. Second of all, uh, his expertise was with uh, criminality and criminal cases, and he said that he has gone, and uh, he was originally, I believe, from the Caribbean, and he, uh, was, he was speaking to the students in the class, and he said, I want you to know something. He said, I travel throughout the entire world, and I observe uh, criminal cases throughout the entire world, and he said, there is no system in the entire world that is better or fairer than the American justice system. Okay, so I start with that. Okay, uh, my next uh, statement is that I was a teacher for 43 years and I worked in some very rough areas and I can honestly tell you that I heard students of mine say to one another, oh, you know what, listen, you don't have to, uh, a new law was passed, so you know, you have to really be careful now uh, because you can uh, end up going to jail. Okay. But up till now, really, you could do what you wanted and y you would never end up going to jail, even though you would do the same will say criminal act. So uh, all, all I see is what's going on in the newspaper, in the media, etc. I see people being murdered. Okay? I see huge uh, murder rates in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, etc. I mean, crime is occurring. And um, I, well, that's the question. The question is, how does my personal experience differ from, you know, why does it differ from what you are saying? I, I'm giving you my true life experiences. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then go over, then over here. I, uh, this may be a question that's better for Dr. Smiley. I, I, all I can tell you is what we've already talked about, which is, you know, by the numbers, by and large, we lock up way more people than any civilization in the history of the world. Way more. And so, I mean, you can either accept that Americans are just more prone to committing crimes than anybody has ever been in the history of human civilization, or you can say, well, maybe there's some other factors going on here. Maybe there's some underlying processes that are causing that number to be artificially inflated. There's violence everywhere. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to your question. All I can tell you is that we're doing it worse here um, by the numbers, strictly by the numbers. And, you know, if you, if you, if you don't accept that, that there's some processes that are making us do it, worse here, then you have to accept the, con you know, the converse, which is um, we're just more prone to criminality, and I don't accept that. Yeah, 
I'm just okay. we're gonna go over the next. Yeah, question. yeah. So. Uh, I have three just kind of different questions. So first is about um, the expansion. When you talk about the expansion in Boston, it's like insanely rapid, like scary rapid. And so I tend to think about this problem as partially like whatever, we've been innovative in being really terrible with pleading out, right? So like I think like, oh, it's a new thing that cops like add all these charges as a way to plead. But then when you talk about Boston, it sounds like, well, actually, maybe it's always been that way, and I'm just curious what no. you think. No. Yeah. So that, yeah, there's been... Because <laughs> I, I didn't talk about Paul Hayes. I went, went an entire hour, and I didn't talk about Paul Hayes. Sorry. <laughs> um, but Paul Hayes is a big deal. There's this case called borden Kircher versus Hayes, and I'll, tr I'll try to blaze through it, but it's an interesting story. It's super interesting, and it's what I opened the book with. Um, and this is what changed everything in the 1970s. Paul Hayes is... Uh, uh, a uh, black man, he's a horse transporter in Lexington, Kentucky, down in my neck of the woods, in 1972. He gets arrested for writing a bad check worth $88.30. At that point in time, you've got judges and lawyers and people talking about plea bargaining like, I'm not really sure that we want to have plea bargaining as the cornerstone of American criminal justice. That was still a popular conversation that was going on. The National Association, I can't remember, the National Commission, there was a National Commission of Criminal Defense Lawyers that um, in 1973 actually made a recommendation that all plea bargaining be done away with by 1978. So there was some mainstream debate at that point in time. Well, 1978, this case, Borden Kircher versus Hayes, Paul Hayes' case goes to the United States Supreme Court. And what had happened to Paul was, is that he didn't want to take that, that uh, the prosecutor's offer on that $88.30 check, because the prosecutor wanted to give him five years. So, uh, okay. I don't want to take five years. I got a job and a family and everything else. I don't want to take five years on an $88.30 check. I'll roll the dice with the jury. Well, the prosecutor says, his words, well, if you put this court through the inconvenience of a trial, I'm going to hit you with the state's habitual offender statute. And that statute at that time in Kentucky carried a, a mandatory penalty of life in prison. So you pick five years, Paul, or you pick life in prison. And Paul's like, Okay, well, I'm going to see what the jury does. And the jury convicts him, and the judge gives him life in prison. Takes that case up to, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, puts the whole debate to bed in that case. And we don't teach this case even in the law schools. I, I, think, I think it's a turning point in American history because that really opens the floodgates. What the, what the Supreme Court says is it's the prosecutor's job to persuade the defendant to give up their right to trial. And if they don't, if they're not persuaded. And this is when, just? 1978. 78. Okay. 1978. And, 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 you know, here the ram and jam is really, and because of the drug war, I mean, this need for expedience is huge. I mean, there's so many criminals doing so many drug crimes. Um, so the Supreme Court says what no other country has said, which is we're going to give carte blanche to prosecutors to just do whatever they want to get these deals to happen. And so Paul Hayes gets a life sentence for an $88.30 check. For, for sake of time, can we just yeah, move yeah, on I'm to the sorry, last I'm question? And then talk, uh, we talk. do have the wine and cheese event, so uh, we can always talk to Professor Cannon up there. Sorry, I'm answering too long. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, I thank you guys for the talk. It was wonderful. Uh, I know here in New York there's a lot of different things with uh, plea bargaining and how it works because we have mandatory minimums here in New York. I was convicted of a crime here in New York where I refused to take a plea. <clears throat> Initially, the judge said, hey, take five to 15 years. I refused to take the five to 15. At the conclusion of the people's case, it became three to nine. And what you mentioned about should you be criminalized if you take it, it got to a point where the legal secretary and the DA came up with a deal with, let them just take an Alfred plea, which would have taken that part off. I refused that. At the completion of the trial, I got sentenced to 25 years to life as a result of refusing the plea. Um, so I understand there's a lot more to this than just they're not being there. Plea bargain is also a necessary element, whereas you can face losing your entire life yeah. for not taking it. You know, I could have took the three to nine years of the Alfred plea. I would have probably been out right away. But you go to jail and you have to think about all these things in prison over time. Uh, so I think it's a lot more that needs to be addressed with this issue as in New York with mandatory minimums. And I don't know if you mentioned that in your book, but the mandatory minimums is a big thing to deal with uh, people taking pleas or not. Yeah. Because the DA has the absolute right to down a mandatory minimum down to almost 
no jail time for almost any charge. So I think that's the big issue is the mandatory minimums that we have in the country. And now everyone being criminalized, which you said with prohibition with the Hobbs Act now, that's the big thing in the black community now is they charge you with something, oh, you're interfering with interstate commerce, boom, it's a federal charge now. And most people here in New York City are getting charged with federal charges now for the most simplest thing. You say, oh, interfering with interstate commerce, and yeah. it's a big thing. Yeah, 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 it is, it is an intractable problem. It is a big log jam of a thing. And this is why I say it's so hard for, for defense attorneys to take an active role in what is essentially a systemic problem. I, I get that question from public defenders, like, what do we do about this? And I'm like, well, you, I, if I were running a public defense agency, which thank God I'm not, I would say, uh, let's aim for getting your, your number of trials to be 10 to 20% higher in a particular region or whatever. Um, but when it comes down to making individual decisions on individual cases, you have to do what's best for your client. You, you have to. You have to. This is the system that we have. It's not the system that we want. Uh, but the book is really about is really about systems, um, and and everything that's wrong with them. And I, I think that you know increasing the. I will say that increasing the number of trials doesn't necessarily mean that we have to try every murder case. I mean, I think there's this conception where you know because you decry plea bargaining because you say you say that we shouldn't be doing 97 percent of all of our cases via plea bargain. Well, that means that we try every case. No, it doesn't mean that. And I think different things are going to work in different jurisdictions. But obviously, if you got you know the difference between three years and twenty-five years on the line, I mean, what else can you do? Yeah, she has a question, but um, sorry. Also, when it comes to certain charges, if the if the district attorney doesn't have enough charges on you. They could leave you in there for 90 days remand. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's the thing. You know, if you're going to be locked up by default. About the buffalo, the guy who killed 14 people. Yeah. He pleaded innocent. So can he now go for a plea bargain? That yes. One question. Sure, yes, yeah. He can? Yes, so sure. Well, I mean, it depends on the pro what the prosecutor wants to do. Now, the prosecutor might say, all right, we're not going to give an offer here. So the prosecutor may not give an offer, right? Maybe, yeah, so maybe. Yeah. Are you asking me or, or, or are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, sure. So uh, stats show that they can be just as uh, brutal, mean. Uh, you know, I think one thing that we've seen in the last two years, right, with kind of the, the death of George Floyd, is that Black Lives Matter, which is now, you know, rearing to a decades old, if we think back to Trayvon Martin in 2012, uh, uh, to now, and during that point, you know, Michael Garner, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, we saw a lot of things being implemented into our police across this country. Diversity training, implicit bias training, hiring more officers of color, uh, um, uh, um, citizen complaint review boards, uh, uh, body-worn cameras, and cops have killed more people each year <laughs> since we implemented all of these things. So, yeah, so, so we started to keep track of this. And actually, the, the, the number of deaths by police have gone up. So all of the reform efforts are not necessarily working. So part of it would say, you know, the reform logic is put more black and brown officers on the streets, and those types of incidences will go down. That's not the case, and I think that's what makes the George Floyd case, not only so visually striking, because we literally watched a man being murdered, but that four cop squad that killed him was the, the exact thing that everyone was calling for. Diversity of officers. There was two white, an Asian, and a black. They all had implicit bias training. They all were on the force for more than a, a couple years. None of them were rookies, right? They had every check, uh, every check mark uh, uh, ticked about who's not going to kill a person. They still killed him. 
Yeah, I mean, all of them, well, I mean, they haven't been convicted in the, but I mean, they were all implicitly, they were all, they were all there to help. And that's why when we watch the video, no one interferes because those other cops, the other white one, the Asian one, and the black one, were all ready, and I'll say it on record, were to exact murder themselves. If you watch their body language, they were ready to strike anyone who was going to intervene with the death of George Floyd. <laughs> Some people are. There are people who are nice to people. Amen. We, there we, is we a, need to have people there, being nice to people. There is such a thing, and I, I, law students don't want to accept this, right? Uh, is is there is such a thing as a systemic evil? You know that a si a system can actually have its own motives, and it's I mean it's, you know it's a common academic idea we think in those terms, but it's tough for lawyers to grasp that. New lawyers to grasp that. Certainly, lawyers that came out of law school in my generation didn't want to think that. You know, well, just by going out and doing the best we can within the system, we are contributing to some terrible thing. You know, but but that I mean, when you have systems that are set up to oppress poor people, and systems that are you know meant to uh, uh, sort of put into to play uh, racist policies. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to cut you off, but yeah. I think, and then we'll we'll round it. I'm sorry, Mac, we're going over time, but you know, I think a great example of that right here in New York is the stop, question, and frisk policy that you might remember. Right, stop, question, and frisk was not written to be ex, you know explicitly racist towards young black and Latinx young men, but it was part of a system design that then was carried out by racist officers, by maybe ra officers that didn't necessarily see themselves as racist, but maybe felt threatened. And so what we saw was cops, not white cops, not black cops, not Latinx cops, we saw cops carrying out stop and frisk in a very systematic and deliberate way that over 80% of all of those stops that were on paper colorblind actually racist, racially motivated. So I think that goes back to what Professor Cannon said, that systems can be inherently flawed and by design uh, impact, again, poor folks, people of color, certain neighborhoods, right? You know, stop, question, and frisk happened in the South Bronx, parts of, the, parts of Brooklyn, parts of Harlem. It wasn't happening on the Upper East Side. It just wasn't happening here, right? But if you go up to 96th Street and... Washington, once you pass 96th Street on the east side, all of a sudden the numbers balloon. So what, what is that invisible barrier? Well, you cross into Spanish Harlem. So, I, I, all right, I'm gonna stop. It's there. hard to accept that, you know, you can put good people into those systems and have bad outcomes. It, you know, it's not just bad apples and yeah. Thank you.